in times like we're going through right now, we need to remind ourselves of that. So often, don't we? We've lost, in this congregation, we've lost so many loved ones this past year. This has been one, one hard year for all of us. And we lost uh, several members of our church this past year. Uh, but we need to keep reminding ourselves that, yeah, we are hurting, we miss them so much, but think about what they are enjoying right now. Yeah. Those who know Christ. They're worshiping around the world. Yeah. They've joined all those, those thousands and thousands and thousands of others who have gone before them uh, centuries past, but also of late with their families, their loved ones, and they're just praising the Lord Jesus Christ. <coughs> their eyes are fixed on Him when they're doing that. And all of their worries and their uh, storms that they faced in this life and went through in this life are behind them. That is no more. And uh, they are having a wonderful, wonderful time. So we just need to remind ourselves of that. And remind ourselves also that we do know Christ. He's coming soon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I really believe that in my heart. I believe He's coming soon. And we're going to join them in the air. Yeah, and that we'll be with the Lord forevermore. Wherefore, the scripture says, comfort one another with these words. And so I submit to you that that's the only thing that can comfort you when you've lost a loved one. It's the only thing that can comfort you, you know? You know that you'll see them again. You know that you'll join them again. You know that you'll be able to spend eternity with them. And you know that when you spend eternity, when you see them again, you won't see them as they were, the suffering that they were going through. You're going to see them whole, perfect, complete, as they are in Christ. And uh, you don't have to worry about seeing them sick anymore. And also, all that's behind it. So we just need to remind ourselves of that. And remind ourselves that these things that we're talking about right now, as we're looking at Revelation, and you can turn to Revelation chapter 13, we don't have to worry about what's going to be happening then because we are not going to be here. We're going to be saved from the storm that's about to pass upon planet Earth. Now, we know something about storm warnings around here, don't we, by now? We have had some storms this year. I mean, the hurricane, the Florence, and then Michael, of course, and then before that, the storm warnings and tornado warnings, you, you, know, you name it, but we've been through it. We know exactly what it means. When they, when they say on television, you know, you need to seek shelter, you need to find a safe place that you can be in. Of course, when the tornado warnings, watches come up. Uh, at first, you know, they'll say that, you know, Things are, might be right for a tornado to, to uh, appear or uh, to form in the atmosphere, so you need to be aware of that. The conditions look like they might be right for that. So that's a tornado watch. So just be awake, be alert to that. But then you'll see something come up and say that, that's a warning taking place. And the warning that takes place, the reason they send that out is because either a tornado has already been spotted or if they see one on the radar somewhere and they say, hey, it's in your area, so you need to seek immediate shelter, get in a safe place. You know, if you are in a mobile home, get out of it. <laughs> and don't try to outrun it. We lived in Tornado Alley in Texas for four years, and we lived in a mobile home. And I'm going to tell you, when they would say that, I would say many times to, to Becky and to the girls, well, what are we going to do? Where are we going to go? I mean, we live in a mobile home. They say, get out of that. And then they say, don't get in the car and try to outrun it. Well, we're going to go. So I would take my chances most times, throw them in the car and try to outrun it. And I didn't ever see one, actually, you know, but they were close by, believe me, and they skipped all around us. But when you hear those, those words, uh, a tornado warning, you better take it seriously, right? Yeah. And I think, I believe that we are about to experience the most violent, I mean, not we, because we're going to be gone. I, but I believe the most horrendous, most awful, most violent storm, the mother of all storms, is about to be poured out upon planet Earth. The storm that I am talking about is the Great Tribulation. We've been talking about this in Revelation chapter 13. And if you read Revelation chapter 13, we know that this is telling us about the appearance of the beast, the Antichrist, and everything that he's going to do when he is in full power upon planet Earth. And what we're reading here in this chapter is, uh, is an, uh, about an awful period of time. And believe me, you do not want to be left behind and be here during this time. It's going to be a time of suffering. It's going to be a time of violence. It's going to be a time of uh, weakness like, like this old world has never known. And But thank God, as I said a few minutes ago, we're not going to be here. 
Why, why do I say that? Because look, if you would, at verses 9 and 10. Now, after it says this about the Antichrist, about his appearance, it says that uh, he, all the world's going to wonder after him. All the world's going to worship him. All the world's going to follow him. Who is likened to the beast? Uh, it, uh, it says in verse 4. Who is likened to the beast? Who is able to make war with him? He speaks great things, blasphemous, power was given to him. And we know that he gets his power from the dragon or Satan himself. Satan empowers him to assume all this power and do all these terrible things to those on the planet at that time. But power was given to him to continue 40 and 2 months or the last three and a half years, as we've said before, of the tribulation period. He opens his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and them that dwell in heaven as well. And then in verse 7 it says it was given to him to make war with the saints. Now the saints that I believe that we look at in the book of Daniel as it's talking about these same passages that are parallel to this. The saints referred to there is none other than the nation of Israel itself. But also I believe not only Jews in that day but Christ, this entails Christians as well. All those who know the Lord Jesus Christ that's on earth during this time. You might say this, you might put, well, there's going to be any saved individuals on the earth through the reign of that. You better believe it is. Multitudes are going to be saved. Multitudes. As a result of the preaching of the two witnesses and the 144,000. Matter of fact, as we read earlier in the book, I believe it's going to be the greatest, greatest revival that the world's ever known. Because after they are martyred, and they have seen in heaven, and John sees the scene, and it's uh, multitudes around the throne, and and the question is asked, where did they come from? They come out of the great tribulation. So these are people who have lost their lives for their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So when did that happen? During the tribulation period. So thousands and thousands, multitudes are going to be saved during that time. And the Bible says in verse 8, All that dwell upon the earth shall worship him who is talking about the Antichrist, the beast, whose names are not written in the book of life, slain from the foundation of the world. But look at verses 9 and 10, if you would. If any man hear, if any man have an ear, I'm sorry, if any man have an ear, let him hear. Then verse 10 says, He that leadeth in captivity shall go into captivity. <laughs> he that killeth with a sword must be killed with a sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. Now verse 9 is what I want you to have, I want you to focus on at this time. If any man have an ear, let him hear. Does that not have a familiar ring to that? We read in the first two, first three chapters, we read many times the same thing. However, something is missing. If any man have an ear, let him hear. I want you to take your Bibles, hold your places there, but go back, if you would, to chapter 2 and look at verse 7. All these letters to the seven churches, the, the end verses, the, the last thing that says to these churches is this. Look at verse 7 of chapter 2. He that hath an ear, same thing we just read, then it says, let him hear what the Spirit said unto the churches. Unto the churches. Do you see that? Look at verse 11. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit said unto the churches. And then verse 17. Another letter, in in the same way. Verse 17. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit said unto what? The churches. The churches. Verse 29, same chapter. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit said unto the churches. And then we go to other letters that's found in chapter 3. We can win at verse 6. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. In verse 13, same thing it says. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. And finally, the last letter that is written to the last church of Laodicea, and we, same this, we find the same phrase that's found in verse 22. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto Unto the churches. Now go back to chapter 13. And again look at verse 9. If any man have an ear. Let him hear. What's missing there folks? Church. The church. That's the fact right. Brother Bobby pointed up. That's a good reason he pointed up. Why? Because the church is up there. The church is not there. And so the church is missing. So we can see that. And to me that is very very noticeable there. Okay, that, this, that the words is not to the ch to the churches is not family. Now, why is that? Well, we just read the reason for that in chapter three, verse ten. 
Look, if you would, chapter 3, verse 10. Let me read it one more time. This is to the faithful church, the church at Philadelphia. And I believe represent again the godly Bible believing. This is God fearing church that is alive on planet earth right before, right at the time of the rapture of the church. Look at verse 10, what it says that These words are promised from the Lord to this church. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from, that from, that very important word, preposition here in the Greek, is ek in the Greek, which means out from, out of, I will keep you out from, out of, the hour of temptation, the hour of testing, this awful period of time, and further described this way, which shall come upon all the world, not just in one a specific localized location, but upon all the world, it says, to try them, to test them that dwell <laughs> upon the earth. Now, folks, that has not happened yet. There's been, always been times of testing. There's always been times of trials and trouble, and this whole world's gone through a whole lot, but never a time like this since the flood, right? We understand that. What this particular period of time is referring to, again, is... The tribulation period. The tribulation period. That period of seven years, which is going to happen, I believe, after the church is taken from the face of the earth. Now, I've got re good reasons to believe that. One reason is, is because after these letters are written, even up to Revelation chapter 19, which encapsula which does contain, if you will, all of the period of tribulation that the world's going to go through, these 21 periods of judgment, that the world's going to go through. The church is not mentioned at all. The church is not mentioned uh, uh, at all until chapter 19. Referred to in chapter 19, but then it's mentioned again later. But the church is mentioned during all this time. So I believe that's good proof to me it is, to me it is proving that the church is not going to be here. Amen. Now what am I saying when I'm talking about the church? You know what I'm talking about. We're not talking about the building itself. The building is just where the church meets. The church are those who are born again. Those who are saved, those who have heard the gospel of Jesus Christ and placed their faith and trust in Jesus as personal Lord and Savior. Those who have done that, listen, are those who are going to be, according to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18, are those who are going to be caught up together with them in the air, with the dead who's going to be raised first, going to be caught up together, meet the Lord in the air. And also, those saints of God, our loved ones, who's going to be with the Lord because they're going to come back with Jesus. When he comes back for the church. Now taking all of that into account. And also the distinctions that's found. The differences that's found. Between the appearance of Christ. The second coming of Christ. Where it be visible to the whole world. And then the rapture of the church. Which is, 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 is very different from the second coming. Is because, because that's going to be invisible. No one's going to know about it. Unless, unless they are part of the church. right? All of those differences together. Proves to us that the church is going to be gone. Amen. Now I believe that partly explains what we read here in chapter 13. <laughs> All the world is going to wonder after the beast. Who is likened to the beast? Who is able to make war with him? In other words, the world as a whole is going to not only wonder after the beast, the Antichrist, this awful person, but the world is going to worship him. We see this in the last part of this chapter that the false prophet's going to come on the scene. The lieutenant, if you would, the, the one who's going to accompany the beast, the Antichrist, he's going to come on the scene and do different things, even cause the fire to come down from the heavens to cause all the world to worship the image of the beast that's going to be made at that time. So all the world's not only going to uh, worship the beast, they're going to welcome him, they're going to follow him, and they're going to wander after the beast. Now, one of the reasons that, that this reassures me that we're going to be taken out of here is because of all of this. All the world is going to wonder after him. All the world is going to worship him. All the world is going to follow him. Don't you believe in your mind, in your heart, and in your soul that the church, as large as it is, and I know compared relatively to the rest of the world, that's small in number, right? But still, the church, still, the true church, still makes up a, a grand <coughs> part of the population of this world. Don't you wonder how in the world can the whole world follow him and worship him and welcome him and he's doing the other things that he's going to do if the church is still here? You see what I mean? There's got to be a rational explanation for that to take place. 
if you think about it, the only explanation that can possibly explain this, this, this concept is this, that the church is gone, is taken away. So then he'll have a, I guess what you could say, he'll have a free course. He'll, have, he'll be able to do anything. He can even declare himself that he is God, as we'll see in a few minutes of time. So all of this taken together with another passage of scripture that I'm going to share with you in a few minutes, convinces me that the church is going to be gone. Now you might say, Pastor, you have explained this over and over and over again. Ad nauseum. You just keep on repeating this, repeating this. And we believe you. We understand this. Why in the world are you bringing this out again? It's because of this. About three or four weeks ago on a Sunday evening, I was watching one of my pros I like to watch on Sunday evenings. You've heard me talk about this many times. Jack Van Hippie didn't thank God he's going to come back home. Boy, it's like he's come back from the dead, did not Y'all been watching him? That man's about 90 years old. And he's come back from the jaws of death. He says God spoke to him in a way like he, he says on August 13th of last year, he said, I'm going to bring you back and I'm going to uh, I want you to be the last day's prophet to warn the people that but uh, listen, get their hearts right and get saved because I'm about to send my son to this world to get the church out of here. And that's what he said. And I'm part of believing, don't you? I really believe that. What that man has been through and to see him now and, and, and preaching the way he's preaching and warning the world the way he is warning and his world, his mind is sharp as a tack, my friends. And he's warning people. He's warning the world. And, and saying some things that need to be said. I was watching that. And then I was watching the next program that comes on. Uh, Christ and Prophet, uh, Dr. Dave Reagan. That's a good program I enjoy. But anyway, he had a prophecy conference uh, in July. I believe it was in July of this summer. And then they showed various speakers that was on that. But they had one speaker on about three or four Sunday nights ago. And it was Jen Markell. You've heard me talk about her. This, this lady, she's probably about 80 years old now, but she's a Messianic Jew that's been serving the Lord Jesus Christ and living with him. But she's got a wonderful program that you can pull it up on the net or radio, perhaps. Uh, every Saturday, it's called Understanding the Times. And she has some of the greatest speakers on this program that really will keep you informed about Bible prophecies that's being fulfilled in our day. But it was her turn to share. She shared and this, and this Bible prophecy conference. And I thought it was good what she shared, but some things that she shared just, just about knocked my socks off, folks. And what she, was, what she was sharing about was about how even in the church today, that there are, even within the evangelical church, as, and we are evangelical church today, but even within evangelical churches today, that pastors all over our land and you can see this on television, you can see it here on the radio, you can see it on the net. There are, are telling people that there's no such thing as a rapture of the church. Now we've always had this debate, you know, debate about uh, pre-trib, mid-trib, pan-trib, all that. We all understand that, you know, about what, but we've always believed, most of us have anyway, I'm talking about the evangelical service, we believe that there's going to be a rapture, you know, that Christ is coming to the church. We might be, you know, debating the time of that when that will happen, whether before the tribulation, during the tribulation, after the tribulation. But we, nevertheless, we all believe that that's going to be a rapture of the church because of passages I've already shared here with you this morning. But she says now, and then she gave a proof of it by giving the names of those who are teaching that. And even, listen, uh, even after her, that she comes on, there's one that comes on every week about that same time. And he's te te teaching people or preaching this same thing, saying that we're going to go through the tribulation. He's training believers uh, what to study, the books to get, and all that, so that we can go out and reach the multitudes during the tribulation period. But she not only said that, but one thing that kind of got me uh, upset a little bit was not only the fact that they don't believe that there's a rapture in the church, but that she showed it on her program in her, in her little videos that she had, there were those who were saying this, that those that believed this in the pre-tribulation rapture, and not only that, but Zionists and believes that, you know, still believes that he, Israel is the chosen people of God. They were saying some of the, the most rude, unkind, the most hateful speech, vitriolic speech that I've ever heard, directed toward those that believe the way we do. Even one even said this, that the reason that the world 
that is in the shape that it is today is because of those who believe and preach a preached tribulation rapture theory. And those who believe that God still has special plans for Israel, his chosen people. Can you believe that? So I looked at that. I scratched my head and I, I preached and shared a little bit with my wife. And then I, she tried to settle me down and she tried to preach a little bit to me and tell me to calm down. I, I started studying a little bit and looking around and seeing some of these things for myself. <clears throat> and to me, it is disturbing. Yeah, it's disturbing to me. Because I don't see how you can... And I can understand that as debates about different ways we believe about the time and the right. But I still cannot understand how they can be those within the church today teaching not only that, that, you know, that, that we might go through the tribulation, but also at the same time, Sharing that, the, listen, that there is no rapture. You're going to go through this period of time and uh, lead up to the second coming of Christ. Some even believe that, of course, that you will be raptured at the end to meet Jesus and come right back. I don't see that myself. But as I was thinking about that and studying this and restudying again and researching a little bit again, I thought to myself, well, if we really believe what the Bible teaches and all we've got to do, I feel like, is connect the dots we can see how the Antichrist will be able to do some of the things that he's doing, going to be doing here that's found in chapter 13, as we looked at already. Look, if you would, I want you to hold your place there and turn back, if you would, one more time to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians, by the way, is right after 1 Thessalonians. But also that comes right before 1 Timothy, Okay. And if you still can't find it, look in your index or your contents and they'll tell you how to get to it. But 2 Thessalonians, again, is a letter that's written by the Apostle Paul. He's talking about the second coming of Christ. He's already talked about the rapture of the church. But he's writing this in response to some of the confusions about that. Evidently, there are someone, or there's several maybe, or perhaps there's one that comes on the scene to this church and tells them that he's had a vision from God. That God has spoke to him by divine revelation. And by the way, you've got to watch people say that today as well. There's still some coming around that says, God told me this, God told me that. Let me give you a word of warning, let me give you a word of knowledge. You better watch people that come to you and tell you things like that. Because the Bible tells us forever, O oh Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Amen. We don't need any more additional revelation. The canon is closed, my friend. Amen. If that was not the case, then someone else could come on the scene and tell you anything in the world they want to tell you. And before you know it, you might well believe them and start following them. Get it settled in your heart and your mind. God has spoken to us ugly finding through His Son, Jesus Christ. Yes, and the kingdom is closed. Amen? Amen? So we need no one to come on the scene to add anything to that. We have prophets coming on the scene today. And I know there's debates, debates even within the church saying that, listen, the time for prophets is not needed anymore because the prophets in the Old Testament and New Testament was giving us revelation that wasn't yet revealed. And that was before the canon was closed. So if a prophet, then some will say in the church, even they guess there is still a time that uh, uh, there's a need for prophets. I don't know. You know, still many debating that as well. But I, this I do know. If someone comes and claims to be a prophet, it better not contradict the word of God. Amen. 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 So that, that's no charge extra to that. Just thought I'd throw that in. But someone has come to this church, this group of believers, and scared them half to death. And you know what that's all about. We said this before. Well, look what, what Paul said. Now, we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, referring to the rapture that he's already talked about in 1 Thessalonians, the first letter, in chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. But then he adds this, that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter, as from us, as... That the day of Christ is at hand. It's already come. Praise in God. other words, the reason they're probably shaken in mind, the reason that they're troubled, the reason they're so upset is because of this. They think someone has come and told them the same thing that I, I told you a few minutes ago that others were saying. There's not going to be a rapture. You're going to be in the tribulation period. You're going to go through this awful period of time that's described in Revelation chapter 13. And furthermore, you're already in that time. Now, someone come on and start, share, start sharing that with us today. 
I guarantee you, we would probably stop thinking about the blessed hope. We'd be scared to death, right? We really would. That's what's happened, this group of believers here. And the Apostle Paul is trying to, trying to reassure them that no, that has not happened yet. He says, let no man deceive you by any means. Uh, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. That's the apostasy here. That's a great turning away. That's a great turning away and abandoning the true faith, the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we are seeing it even in our day. Haven't we? we talked enough about that? We know that we're going through that. But that's got to happen first. I don't think he was talking about the rapture here. This is a letter that's not discussing that. He's already discussed the rapture. He's saying simply this, that the second coming of Christ, the day of Christ, that is, that leads up to the second coming of Christ, the tribulation period, this seven-year period of time, cannot happen until these events happens right here, the great apostasy. And then that man of sin be revealed and son of perdition. Who opposes, and he's talking about the beast here, the Antichrist, who opposes and exalting himself above all that is called God or that is worship, so that he as God sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now what, what does he mean here? You know exactly what he's talking about here. We've talked about this at length before. The Antichrist, the beast, he's going to come on the scene He's going, to come, he, he's, going to, he's going to come on the scene as a great, wonderful world leader. We've already talked about this, the, the time and the horse and about what he's going to come out of, this, probably these nations that make up the Roman, revived Roman Empire, that he's going to come out of that section in the world in Europe. He's going to be revealed, but he's going to come on the scene as a great peacemaker. Because Daniel chapter 9, verse 27 tells us, that he's going to confirm a covenant agreement, if you will, a mm -hmm. peace covenant, if you will, that the Jews and the Arab nation, the Muslim nations, will be satisfied with. So because of that, listen, that's going to be a period of peace like the world has never known for three and one half years. He is the rider of the white horse. Remember we talked about that earlier in Revelation chapter 6? So he's going to come on the scene, and the reason he's going to be uh, so worshipped and wanted after and followed all the work because he's going to be the man that finally comes on the scene that's going to have the answer, the right answer, for all of the problems and the confusions and the chaos that the world is going through. And by the way, it would be a good time to here right now, wouldn't it? Because I've never seen such a time of chaos and confusion. But he's going to come on the scene with his great plans of peace, this covenant that the Jews and the Arab nations will <coughs> agree to. And finally, listen, Finally, the, that section of the world, listen, will know peace like they've known long before. So that's going to happen. Hasn't happened yet, has it? Just by the every administration, the uh, presidential administration, every president we have wants to come up with a plan that, the, that these two sides can agree to. But it hasn't happened yet, and I don't believe it's going to happen until this man appears. Right? He's going to be the one that's going to have a plan that they can agree to. And because of that, I believe because of that, and that somewhere in that first period of time, that first three and a half years, the Jews will be allowed to rebuild their temple. Sure. Probably close in proximity, close to where the mosque of Omar is right now. Right. I believe it's going to happen, folks. Matter of fact, it's so close they're making preparations for that right now, even right. as we're speaking here today. So it's going to happen. Well, in about three and a half years into, the, into this seven year period of time, he is going to do the unthinkable. He's not going to need the Jews anymore. He's not going to need the false apostate church anymore. He's going to declare himself that he is God. He's going to march into this temple, this rebuilt temple. He's going to take his seat there, and he's going to show himself that he is God. Let's see what Paul is saying here. And Paul says, listen, that hasn't happened yet. None of this has happened yet. This stage is not even set for that to happen yet. This great apostasy has got to happen first. He says, remember you not, verse 5. He says, don't you remember that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? Don't, wouldn't you like to sit down with the Apostle Paul? And just to be able to sit under him. I mean, just to sit there and listen to this man who was once a hater of Jesus who thought he was doing God a favor by doing everything he could contrary to the name of Christ, who despised Christians and the church, who persecuted the church, 
who was there by when Stephen was stoned and witnessed that, gave his approval for it, as we see in the book of Acts. But then out he was miraculously conferred it on the Damascus Road, and he was changed just like that, became a believer, and from persecuted he became a preacher. And how he, everywhere he went from that point on, he went to the synagogue every way he could get an audience to share with them and to prove to them that this Jesus is the Messiah. He is the Christ. He is the Son of God. He is the Savior. Wouldn't you like to hear some of those messages? But can you imagine as well him telling about the second coming of Jesus? Paul says, don't you remember when I was yet with you? I told all you these things. But then he says this in verse 6. And now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. In other words, listen, let me read verse 7 too. For the mystery of iniquity that hath already worked, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Now there's something that's forbidden the Antichrist, the beast, from coming on the scene, scene and beginning this period of time, we know is a great tribulation. There's something restraining him. There's something that's hindering him. There's something that's even in place holding down this great evil at this time. And that, whatever it is, there have been many uh, ideas about this, many opinions about this, even beginning with the Roman church and uh, other things as well, Israel, Egypt, you name it, the, the ideas and opinions has been there. But whatever it is, it is strong enough and powerful enough to keep the Antichrist from appearing and to hold down this, this evil, this weakness that's going to break out when he comes on the scene. What is that? I believe it's the church. Amen. I believe it is. Look at verse 6. And you know what? That's a neuter noun, pronoun. It could be a principle or it could be a thing. You know what withholds or what restrains that he might be revealed in his time. Who is it? He has talked about the Antichrist. The mystery of Nicholas hath already worked on it. He, that's masculine, if you will, who now letteth or restrains or hinders, will restrain until he, masculine, be taken out of the way. Now, what is a neuter? Again, uh, pronoun, meaning it's a principle. It could be a principle. It could be a thing. That he is a masculine. It could refer to a person. So whatever it is, this is, it must be removed, taken out of the way, before the Antichrist can be revealed. So it's got to be powerful enough to hold, hold back him. It's got to be strong enough to hold down evil itself, as we said a moment ago. It's got to be strong enough to do it. And who is able to, the only one that I know of that could possibly do that, to hold down all that evil and restrain the wickedness and the Antichrist from being, and prevent him from being uh, 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 appearing at any time, the only one that I know could do that, being strong enough, would be God himself. Right? Only God Himself. And guess what? God is going to do that. And He's doing it right now. I'm talking about God, the Holy Spirit. I'm talking about the church. That's you. That's me. The Bible tells us in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 3, also 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and chapter 3 is talking about the church as a corporate body, as a whole. It's talking about the, 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 the church as a whole. You are the temple of God. And whoever destroys the temple of God, God will destroy. He's talking about a corporate body of believers, like a gathered church, for example, like us. We are all are the temple of God. Not just building, but you are a temple of God. And then chapter 6, he says the same thing, but then he personalizes it individually. He says, don't you understand, after he says some other things about a person being joined with a prostitute or harlot, don't you understand if you do that? Man, you're bringing Jesus into this thing with you. You don't want to do it because you need to realize that you are a temple of the living God. Your body becomes a place of the Holy Ghost. Isn't that amazing? So whatever you do, you need to keep that in mind. Whatever you do, any wickedness, any perversion, anything you do, you need to understand. You, If you do know Jesus, you're bringing Jesus along with you in the person of His Holy Spirit. Now, what he is talking about right here, and this is the only, and again, it reaffirms my, uh, it reaffirms me, to me, that is, that I believe I'm not going to be here when this thing happens. When this storm uh, comes up on this earth, and I believe it's coming soon, I believe the storm clouds are on the horizon right now, don't you? And the reason I say it is because all the signs are pointing to these. The, the storm is approaching, folks. So you better seek safety. 
Now, the only safe place that you can find is in Christ, in Jesus. Knowing Him personally, believing upon Him, receiving Him as your Savior and Lord. And if you do that, you are safe during the storm. Why? Because you're going to be taken out of here before the storm takes place. Now, look at what it says, verse 6 and 7. Let me read it again because we've got to get through. Now you know, listen, he's talking to these Thessalonian believers. Now you know, you need to understand this, what withholdeth that he might be revealed in this time. Talk about the Antichrist. The mystery of iniquity all doth already work. It's been working right now. Only he who now leveth or hinders, restrains, will hinder, restrain until he be taken out of the way. That he refers to the church. And then when the church is taken out of the way, how is the church going to be taken out of the way? Church, by way of what? The rapture. Amen. Amen. When the rapture takes place, then shall that wicked one be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth. He's going to have a short reign, folks, only three and a half years when he begins to, you know, deify himself out of that church. Very short, 12 to 6 days. Then the Lord shall consume him with the spirit of his mouth, and we're going to see this in Revelation, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the work of Satan with all power and signs and lying money. Can I read you once more what Donald Gray Barnhouse said? I quoted this a few weeks ago, but I want to quote it again. Can I? And give him a complete quote. Listen to what he says. Well, he said, what is keeping the Antichrist from putting his appearance on the world stage? You are. You and every member of the body of Christ on earth. The presence of the church of Jesus Christ is restraining, this is, is restraining form that refuses to allow the man of lawlessness to be revealed. True it is, the Holy Spirit who is, is, a, is a real restrainer, but as, as I can see in First, Thessalonians, First Corinthians, those two passages, when it teaches the Holy Spirit indwells a believer, and the believer's body is a temple of the Spirit of God. Put all believers together, then let the Holy Spirit indwell in each of us, and you have a formidable restraining force. For when the church is removed at the rapture, the Holy Spirit goes with the church, insofar as his, his restraining power is concerned. His work in this age of grace will be ended. Then he goes on to say, Satan will be able to put his plan into full swing by bringing this man on the center stage to take control of the world. The rapture will, listen, will throw the door wide open for the Antichrist to come to power and bring forth an outbreak of evil unlike any that has ever occurred before. The fact that the restrainer is still in place right now means, listen to this, this will bless your heart, the fact that the restrainer is still in place right now means that Satan must wait on God's timing before he can unveil the Antichrist. God, the sovereign God, is in control. Amen. 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 That's enough to make a Baptist shout. Amen. 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 So we are safe from the storm. Yeah. We ain't got to go through this. But can you imagine? It's bad right now, isn't it? It's terrible right now. Yeah. Look at all the evil that's going on in our world today. Look at the evil that's going on in our country today. I mean, it's being promoted by the media and by so many stars in Hollywood and by mm. even certain political parties. I mean, if we just try to say, well, hey, that, that is wrong according to the Word of God. Right. I mean, that's wrong. A homosexuality is wrong according to the Word of God. Amen. Same sex is wrong because it goes outside the bounds of what God has determined and created for what the only true marriage relationship should be about between a man and a woman. Right. And we say that's wrong. And we say that the other things that, and, and I'm trying to be nice here, trying to be nice. And like, and like someone said, we need to love them to Christ, but we need to tell them the truth too. Amen. If we believe what this book says, those that dies uh, in that kind of lifestyle, the scripture says, and I believe what the scriptures say, is going to go to hell. It will not inherit the kingdom of God. Right. But it's so evil now. I'm just saying that uh, it, we're, we're living that period of time. And someone told me the other day, the only thing I can come to this conclusion is we're living that time where we're calling good evil and evil good. Right. Calling evil good and good evil. Right. We got our wives crossed somewhere. 
That's the mark of a reprobate nation. Amen? Amen. That's what it is. I'm just telling you the truth. Amen. But that's the way it is today. But we think it's bad now. How bad is it going to be when the church is gone? Y'all think about that. How bad is it going to be when you're gone, when the church is gone, when great preachers of the gospel is taken out of here and then anything and everything goes? Your family, your friends, and the Bible goes on to say, and I'll tell you this next time, that your family, friends that's rejected Christ is going to go along with the rest of the world and follow you. They will take that mark, and when they take that mark, they seal their destiny for eternity. Let's stand by his back. You know, Lord, we pray. Oh, Father, we pray. And I know, Lord, that today in preaching like this is not popular field to preach and understand that. But we have to tell the truth. Lord, I'm responsible and accountable to you, and I must tell you the truth, and I must warn, as your word says. And not to do so, Lord, I feel like there will be blood on my hands one day when I stand before you. But that's all we can do is just warn. All we can do is share like we have this morning. And oh, Lord, I pray, I pray that if it's anyone, Lord, anyone that's listening to me right now, whether it be here in this place, whether it be going to other means of, of, of presenting the gospel that we have today, radio, or the internet, or whatever, Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would convict them. And Lord, convince them of their need to trust Jesus. Because Jesus is the only way out, Lord. He's the only, the only safe that we have, Lord. The only safe place we have is in Christ. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes unto the Father but by him. It's only by believing in Jesus that we're saved. So, Lord, I pray. I pray that you speak to every heart. If there's anyone here today that's never truly trusted Christ, Lord, please give them the, the courage to do what they need to do right now. And we'll thank you for all you do in Jesus' name.